Okay, good day and welcome Mr. William Gerdner. We are very happy and honored to have you here with us today. I really appreciate that you took the time and the energy to join us. Um, you wrote 13 books and you dedicated your life to the pursuit of truth and knowledge and you are exactly the kind of man we need in today's world to educate us and to inform us with a better understanding of our predicament and I'm sure you can offer us some practical solution and uh, an insight into uh, the situation we are dealing with. So if you don't mind, kindly introduce yourself a little bit and then let's delve deeper into the challenging state of our decaying civilization. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I'm really pleased uh, to join you and your group. You're welcome. Uh, these, these occasions are few and far between these days uh, in countries like Canada because uh, the country has clearly been swinging ever more leftward. Um, we're kind of in the situation. I remember when uh, when William Buckley was uh, critiquing the liberal international liberal community. He said they're the kind of people who think that when the Berlin Wall went down, all the Germans ran to the east. <laughs> but um, Canada is a bit like that. Um, there is not much in the way of a conservative resistance <clears throat> any longer. Uh, I got involved when uh, the father of our present prime minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, was prime minister and realized what he was doing to my country, which was fundamentally um, tearing it off its traditional roots, political and moral roots, and converting it into what I then described as a more French style nation. I mean by that a nation more governed by code law, which was encapsulated in his so-called Charter of Rights and Freedoms of 1982, than, it, than in its traditional common law, British common law and parliamentary tradition. I got very alarmed and I was especially alarmed because most of my friends and neighbors were not alarmed. So I thought someone has to speak out. And the subtitle of my, my first book was called The Trouble with Canada. And the subtitle of it was A Citizen Speaks Out. And I wanted to present the arguments to the Canadian people simply as a citizen. You know, I didn't put PhD on the book and all that kind of thing to scare people away from it. And I tried to write it in a very direct um, citizen to citizen language. And uh, if you don't mind me saying so, that book uh, shocked a lot of people in this country because it became an almost immediate success after having been turned down about by about five different publishers. Uh, in fact, I don't want to take up the whole time telling you this story, but it was interesting because I finally said, I'll publish it myself. I'll put $5,000 into this project and do it myself. So I hired an editor and um, three weeks later, he called back and said that he loved the book. I almost fell off my chair <laughs> to hear that. And he said, in fact, I loved it so much. I took it down to Canada's largest trade publisher, and they want to see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So this relates to our discussion about the family today, because when I walked in the office, the president of that company, a fellow named Jack Stoddard, said, well, we're liberals here. And to show how open-minded we are, once in a while, we ought, we have to do a book like this. And uh, But we don't know anything about you. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, at the time, uh, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was trying to bring in a national daycare scheme, which then was going to cost, you know, $4 billion. So in the 1980s, that was an awful lot of money. It still is. So I turned to the president and I said, well, let's just say that you'd have to drag me stark naked across this country behind a team of wild horses to get me to admit that a government daycare scheme was better for a child than a loving father and mother in the home. 
And Jack just went, well, I guess that tells us who you are. He said, welcome to uh, General Publishing, which was the name of his company. And then he turned, I'm only saying this to give you a feel for how much these people don't know about what the citizens are actually thinking. Because he turned to his general manager, and I only heard about this 30 years later, and he said, Don, he said, we're liberals. We should do books like this once in a while, but it won't sell a thousand copies. Well, he printed 2,500 anyway, and they sold out in the first week. And the book went into eight publishings and eventually sold something like 50,000 copies and became number one in Canada three months later. Wow. This was, this was not only a shock to me, of course, a, a delightful shock, but a That's shock brilliant. to the left. A shock to the left. They didn't realize that that there are millions of citizens in this country, as there are in every other democracy, who are not silent majority, if they're even close to a majority. They're silenced. They are not allowed to speak. The channels and avenues for their speech are cut off at almost every turn. My book happened to surprise the Canadian publishers, media, and academics. They didn't know who the hell I was. And here was this book becoming number one. I mean, what are we going to do? Well, they couldn't do much. It was already out there. But when it came to writing the second book, which was The War Against the Family, they knew who I was. That book got banned in bookstores. It got banned by media. Uh, big, big national broadcasters trying to hound me out of their studios with vitriolic opposition to what I was trying to say. And I would turn to them and say, you're supposed to be speaking to the people about a number one best-selling author's work, not fighting back. Mm -hmm. I never hear you fighting back against anyone else. Why are you fighting back against me? Well, of course, it was ideological. They were doing it because my books were attacking the growing embrace of left-wing ideology in Canada, which is now everywhere. It's so bad now that we're probably like your country, I don't know, where uh, political correctness is on every street corner and the people are frightened to speak their minds. Well, I have never been frightened to speak my mind, and that's why I put a citizen speaks out at the bottom of my books. And I tell my kids what my father told me. He said, know what you think, say what you think, and do what you say. And that, to me, has always been a guide in my life. And, uh, okay, you need a thick skin for this kind of thing. Uh, because it can get a little nasty <laughs> sometimes. But when I'm giving a public speech and someone stands up and says, Mr. Gardner, I'm outraged by what you've been saying. I look him right in the eye and I say, well, you couldn't be more outraged than me. Now, what's your point? <laughs> and you should, you should see the whole room. I mean, it's like air coming out of a balloon. Yeah. They just settle down. And if they have any, any brains at all, they say, OK, I see what you mean. I say, of course. I said, I, I can't deal with your emotions. But I'd love to deal with your arguments. What are your arguments? And as likely as not, they don't have any. And they say so. They're just upset. And when they realize I'm upset too, it all comes down to, am I able to persuade them with better arguments than the ones they have? Or, uh, and I often tell my conservative friends, liberals are not bad people. They're good people with bad ideas. Your job is to give them better ideas because they will respond, they will rise to a better idea than the one they already have. But they're frightened to let it go until they hear the better idea. <laughs> so get busy and work on telling them what the better ideas are and why they're better. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. It seems like uh, those liberals uh, usually have the feeling or the belief that they are holding to the higher moral ground, even with no um, arguments to support that standing. They just feel good about the notion of equality and all the other postmodernism, post uh, which is uh, butchering our society. Um, I, I would like... 
I would like to ask you before anything, um, do, do you believe that everything that we are witnessing before our, our eyes nowadays, is it an organic, natural, uh, or perhaps cyclical uh, phenomena, or is it something orchestrated and pushed by an enemy that we can and should identify? It's interesting. I think what, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're asking me is, is there a conductor to the orchestra? Yes. And I, my answer is no, and you don't really need a conductor. What you need is an ideological framework or direction, which has been put about in the public mind, probably in an unexamined way, but which people find more appealing in general. And they share these feelings with each other, and that's the conductor. It's the ideological um, movement at work. I wrote a book recently, which I recommend to your people, if you'll excuse me for holding it up. It's, it's, it's called The Great Divide. Mm -hmm. Why liberals and conservatives will never, ever agree. And it's available from Encounter Books in New York. And um, the reason I'm promoting it here is because I think it's a really, really important book. It's the first book I know of, which at the end of every short chapter gives you a kind of graph, a graphic comparison of the liberal versus conservative disposition in the world at large. It goes back a little bit into history, but not much. And it basically, people write to me and say, oh my God, I didn't realize how conservative I, I really am and didn't know how to put words to it, but now I do. Sometimes actually they'll say, I didn't know how liberal I really am. And I say, well, either way, I, I'm more conservative myself and I'd like you to come over here too. But at least the book helped you clarify your thoughts and now you can compare the two sides on every issue. So that mm -hmm. book is 14 chapters and everyone has a little table at the end which helps people figure out where they lie on the liberal versus conservative uh, perspective. Uh, so when people say to me, what's the, what's the um, thrust of the book? And I say, look, there's a fellow out there admiring the scenery in uh, Tel Aviv or Toronto, whatever. It's a beautiful day. And suddenly the buildings start to shake and bricks are falling off the buildings and they start to crumble. And he says, oh my God, it's an earthquake. But it's not an earthquake. It's the consequences of the earthquake. The earthquake is actually invisible. It's in the geological forces that he can't see way beneath the ground. He's just looking at the rubble, which is the consequence of the earthquake, the invisible earthquake. Ideology is the same in my view. We have invisible ideological forces which are grinding away out of sight. And that's why in this, in this uh, Great Divide book, I tried to bring them into sight. But for most people, they're out of sight. They can't see them. All they're seeing is the rubble on the surface, political rubble, moral rubble, confused arguments, uh, uh, parents fighting teachers, teachers pushing back, all that kind of stuff. But they aren't really getting at the underlying reason for the rubble at the surface. So if I have any contribution to make to the international, or at least the Western struggle over modernity, uh, you'll probably find it in that book. The War Against the Family, by the way, the War Against the Family lost me a lot of traditional conservative acquaintances and friends because they're not real conservatives. They call themselves conservatives. They have nothing to, to do with the philosophy of Edmund Burke, for example. They probably never even heard of him um, or read any of his unbelievable works or David Hume for that matter. So in fact, they're kind of libertarian conservatives. They're fiscal conservatives. They're worried about budgets and money and the size of government and that kind of thing. And of course, so am I. But when it comes to topics like um, uh, feminism, radical feminism, and its destruction of um, society, uh, uh, comes to attacks on the family, to abortion, to euthanasia, 
uh, to homosexuality, all these things. No, they're libertarian. Let people live the way they want. And I say, well, you're not really a conservative. Why do you say well, that? And I say, well, because there's a difference between between um, normalizing uh, something and uh, tolerating it. Uh, I'm okay to tolerate lots of things, but I don't want to normalize them. And I don't want them normalized in the schools or for my children or my family. So, you know, get out of my way if you want to normalize the abnormal. Uh, we've lost any sense today of what the abnormal is. You see, we uh, don't even use the word. Um, we're all about equality of outcome. And uh, we're not about liberty, responsibility, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you ask about the conductor, I'd say it comes down to the sum total of these interlocking ideological forces operating below the surface. If I may talk about the family a bit further, we got to go back to Plato. Yeah, um, actually, that that leads me to my next question, if I may. Um, I, I, I wrote it down. Um, I said there is obviously an historical war between the hive mind of collectiv collectivism perpetuated by scholars and philosophers. And I told that the philosophers are the conductors uh, and they are fighting against free and responsible men and women and their families. So maybe you can guide us through the main figures in history that are responsible for promoting this insane uh, ideologic uh, yeah, it sounds like you it sounds like you could do it as well as me, but let me start by saying, and I have this argument with a with a scholarly friend of mine, a wonderful man, who loves Plato. And I say, well, Plato was a smart dude. I said, but I think he was dangerous uh, to institutions like the family uh, because he correctly observed that the family is an engine for the production of social and moral and individual difference. That's what happens in the private family. Some families are smart, some are stupid, some are lazy, some are hardworking, you know, some are industrious, some are not, some are honest, some are dishonest. Families tend to produce differences, different human beings. Um, I personally like that because I think uh, individual differences should be encouraged within the moral boundaries that we all understand. But Plato didn't like it at all because he wanted the perfect society. And he happened to, whoa, I lost you. There you are. Are you still there? Of course. Oh, sorry, my screen went blank for a moment. So anyway, um, Plato, Plato lived at a very difficult time politically in Athens. And he wanted a formula for the perfect society. So he gave that to us in his book, The Republic. And in The Republic, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said that in this perfect society, which was not egalitarian, by the way, in the sense that we mean, he understood certain differences he wanted to preserve, like between the guardians, the regular people, the philosopher kings, and all the rest of it, and the soldiers, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but within those classes, um, he didn't want change anymore. So he tried to create the perfect, unchangeless uh, society. And um, in order to make that happen, he said, we must, we must take the children away from the, their parents. And I'll quote now, he said, no child should, should know his parent, nor parent his child. They would be not only produced in a kind of a platonic gangbang, excuse my expression, <laughs> You know, where the women would all be shared in common by the men, yeah. but they would be raised in common by the entire society and would not know their parents. Uh, in other words, they would be raised in a rigidly similar way, a totalitarian way, top to bottom. Uh, and you probably know exactly who picked up that theme uh, quite a bit later was people like Frederick Engels and his buddy Karl Marx. In fact, mm -hmm. um, where is it? Here's, here's Engels' book on the origin of the family, private property, and the state. It's actually a very soundly 
argued book uh, rooted, unfortunately, on very dangerous uh, principles uh, to the effect that the family is the cause of all, the private family is the cause of all human grief. He wanted one big public family. So he said the private family should be basically abolished. Women should be driven into the workplace to create wealth, just, just like men. And um, his, his whole book is, is about that. Uh, and, and of course, I don't have to mention Rousseau. Rousseau was basically anti any private association. So there's a long history of this kind of thinking that has come right down to our day. And now we have it with radical feminism. Most radical feminists study Engel's book. Of course, they study Marx. And um, they feel that women are the slaves of their husbands and ought to get out of the private home into the commercial workplace. And socialist governments love that because they make more tax money. In fact, probably the only way you could keep a truly so-called social democratic, I don't like the phrase, but social democratic nation like, say, Sweden, which is where a lot of this really got going, uh, the only way you can float these kinds of societies if, is if you do drive everyone into the workforce. And then you are collecting a lot of more tax money than you would have with just a single earner. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sweden, by the way, was a model for Canada and for Trudeau. He referred to it as the middle way. Neither communist nor greedy capitalist like those damn Americans, that sort of thinking, you know. Uh, yeah. So he likes he liked the Swedish way. Now, what happened in Sweden? Sweden originally, like up until the 1930s and 40s, was a, I'm going to say, almost very rigidly, capitalistic, no? and very conservative society, very family oriented, very uh, free family oriented, old, very church, church going, uh, Lutheran, I think, <laughs> can't remember. But anyway, um, Sweden became a model for Canada, for our Prime Minister Trudeau. And um, he listened carefully to the speeches given by, especially by three or four Swedish intellectuals. This was distinctly a top-down revolution in Sweden. I mean, really, how do you convert a deeply traditional society into a radical egalitarian society within a couple of decades? You know, it happened very fast. You know what she said, Alva said? It's easy. You just need four or five people at the top who have their hands on the levers of power, and you need uh, philosophical commitments to this ideal of the egalitarian state. And uh, they set about doing it, that it would, was not difficult uh, to change an entire country around. And so what do you have in Sweden? They're not actually anti-family. Uh, there's a wonderful book written by an American named David Popino called Disturbing the Nest. And a lot in that book is about Sweden. And I picked a lot of my data and arguments. I met him too, a lovely man. Uh, from his book, Disturbing the Nest, and you will find a chapter in War Against the Family um, called The Swedish uh, Case, whatever. I can't remember what, what I call it. This, this is that book. Excuse all the advertising. This is a big book. It's heavy. <laughs> and the reason it's a big book uh, is because I didn't want to do it again, and I needed to cover all the, the story. So the subtitle of this book is A Parent Speaks Out, not a citizen this time, but a parent, on the political, economic, and social policies that threaten us us all. And there's, there's a chapter in there. Um, the Swedish called Lesson. The, it's called The Swedish Lesson, uh, which is a bit out of date now, but it's still relevant to what happened. And you'll find some of the quotations from... Alva Myrdal and her husband Gunnar. He was a Nobel economist in economics, by the way, in, mm -hmm. in that chapter. I, and I would say to any of your listeners, you should read this book if you want to understand the wraparound story of what has happened to the family in the West. There's some terrible stuff in this book. By terrible, I mean it's anguishing to read. And it's just hard to believe that sensible people would say some of the things they have said create the documents they have created 
and try to pour them down the throats and into the hearts and minds of little children in our schools. I mean, really hard to believe. But it's all there. It's all backed up. It's all footnoted. Uh, if, if there's one book you, you want to read on what happened to the family in, in the Western democracies, uh, this is it. I, I wept many times writing things in this book on the on the abortion holocaust and the euthanasia you know ter terrible scenes actually quoted in the book about young disabled men being basically euthanized killed by scientists because they thought the quality quality of his life was not worth living and anybody who knows about that phrase you know the labels und Weltes Leben, the German phrase about a life that's not worth living. Of course, this type of phrase ran all through the Nazi Holocaust uh, during the Second World War and before. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the so, result of the eugenic movement, which actually started in the U.S. and Britain. Britain. Yes, California in particular, where the examples were taken for many of the things that. Hitler invoked. Uh, this is terrible stuff, but I do recommend the book. And I, all I can say to your listeners is you better be sitting down when you read it. And I don't think you'll need any other book myself. I don't say that out of pride. Uh, well, I'm proud of the book. Uh, I didn't mean to be vainglorious. I just saying there's hundreds of books on the family out there. This is the most complete one I'm aware of. I agree. Thank you for, for, for this. Uh, I would like to go into the details of the different angles and uh, different uh, attacks on the family. So if you don't mind, let's start by talking about the daycares and the education system and how it's uh, the, the devastating effect it has on our kids and the family. If we can start with that, please. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, daycare. I personally am not against a little bit of daycare. I think socialization is important for children, but too much daycare is devastating. And um, probably the most damaging effect of too much daycare is the bonding that young children do to complete strangers who are their so-called caretakers, who then leave and take other jobs and are replaced. Children in these circumstances uh, soon learn not to trust their own emotions, not to reach out and not to ask for the sort of emotional bonding which you would always get from a parent. I mean, I always say the most wonderful thing about the natural family is that parents give unnaturally deep love to their children, love they will not give to other children. So when you go into a public daycare center or a private daycare center, because they're all public, really, and you ask the workers how they treat the children, you know what they'll say? Well, we treat them all the same. We treat one just the same as the other. And you know what I say? That's the problem. Parents don't do that. They give their children special love, unusual love, <laughs> that they won't give to other children. And children know what that is and they get used to it, and it builds a tremendous base of confidence for them, which is undone by daycare centers all over the world. Never mind the disease aspect and all that. In my chapter on daycare in this War Against the Family, you'll find this um, very interesting experiment. I think it was done at the University of Minnesota or something like that, where they put a bit of uh, tapioca in a child's Diaper. I don't know if you know what tapioca is. We used to eat it when I was a kid. It's a kind of pudding. But they put a black dye, uh, but they put a dye in it, in this one diaper. And they had a black light in the daycare center with about 20 other kids all in there. And the black light uh, made the, the dye in the tapioca in the diaper, if it got out, would make it shine. You would see it on a special video camera. You couldn't see it with your eyes, but you could see it on the special black, black black light room camera, whatever. Well, it was shocking because within about an hour, there were little bits of the glowing tapioca on the child's leg, 
just under the diaper and then down his leg and then in his hands. And then because he touched his eyes and his ears and everything, it was all over his face and in his hair. And then it was in the hair and the face of the child next to him and so on. By the end of the day, that black lit uh, innocent tapioca, I mean, it wasn't feces or anything, it was tapioca. By the end of the day, it was all over the daycare center and no one knew it. Well, the purpose of the experiment was just to illustrate what a lot of people were aware of in the first place, that most daycare centers, I realize some are much better than others, but almost all daycare, daycare centers, and a professor I was reading at the time who was studying this, it's his phrase, not mine, he said they're like the open sewers of the 20th century comparing them to the open sewers of life in, say, London in the 16th and 17th centuries when there was garbage everywhere. Bad for kids. And by the way, in my chapter on homosexuality in The Great Divide, uh, I make the argument. It's not mine. I describe the argument that these uh, daycare centers uh, have something to do with the socio or psychodynamics of the formation of homosexuality in men and women. Uh, so then in a, so. Sense, in a sense, these societies can create as much of it as they want if they do certain things like push millions of children into, into daycare centers. Uh, attachment theory is a very real thing. I've studied it a little bit, although I'm no expert. And it has to do with the whole business of um, children who have, let's say, uh, remote fathers and suffocating mothers will end up spending a lot of their lives trying to find the male substitute for the loving father who wasn't there. Um, and unfortunately, the daycare experience can make that more uh, possible be because they learn to shy away from emotional bonding for the reasons I, I mentioned. Daycare, a lot of daycare centers, they have high turnover of staff. Children soon learn to be suspicious of love. I understand. And and what is your opinion about the education, the public education system nowadays and all the garbage they are feeding into our children? Uh, most of the people here in our resistance group are trying to find alternative solutions to education of our children, especially homeschooling. And I would like to hear your opinion, please. I think homeschooling is terrific. It's the way all schooling used to be until governments got involved. There's a very good Canadian writer, his name is West, W-E-S-T, who wrote a book on the history of public education. And um, he has a lot of things to say about the levels of literacy and uh, things like that. And uh, before governments got involved, it, it was much higher than it is today on average. Uh, when it comes to um, public schooling, I realized that there are some very good public schools. They tend to be in very good neighborhoods. Uh, high achieving, economically more successful neighborhoods than the inner city type of public school. Uh, but mostly, and I've got four chapters on education and war against the family. I urge people to read them. Uh, one chapter is called Looking After Their Minds. It's about the failure of education in the public schools. Uh, the other one's called Looking After Their Bodies, which is about the failure of physical health and fitness in the public schools. And the other one's called looking after their souls or their spirits, uh, which is where you get into so-called sex ed. And that's a devastating chapter, which again, <laughs> you better be sitting down. I don't know where I found all the material for that chapter, but I did. It's all in one place. And uh, it's a shocking thing to read, you know, about these teachers in the 70s, 60s and 70s, you know, putting condoms on bananas and grade six classes and things like that and and proselytizing the joys of anal sex to uh, high school kids and and telling young girls before they even graduate 
that if they get pregnant, the teacher will arrange an abortion, which is their right, without even telling their parents, you know, that kind of thing, getting them involved. So devastating stuff. Uh, now, you said public schools. I happen to have gone to a private school myself. I was, I'm going to say, dumped at a pretty good private school when I was 10 years old. I never went home again for any length of time. I don't know what my parents were doing all that time because all us four kids were in private schools. I have to say in the day, a private school did cost private money, but it wasn't like today where some of these schools are like many universities. It's quite shocking, actually. And they've all been tainted now with the public education lore. Uh, I went to a school in Oakville half an hour, from, maybe an hour from here. And I went back there recently. I couldn't believe it. There was rainbow designs all over the sidewalks in the school and um, posters up in the lobby of the, of the hallways saying gay is OK. And my grandson came home from his school where the same signs were put up. And he said, Grandpa, what, what are they saying? What do they mean gay is OK? Are they saying I should be trying this, this kind of thing? He was very, very disturbed and upset, you know. Anyway, the long and short of it is, I'm not sure what it's like today because of this invasion of the leftist ideology into the private schools, because it's certainly there now, which it wasn't 30 or 40 years ago. They were kind of an independent bastion and very much touched by tradition. It's not the same now. And uh, I think the standards of scholarship, schooling have fallen. They're all now into the social justice stuff and, you know, everybody's oh, so feeling. And I get their monthly or bi-monthly magazines and it's all the left wing stuff. It's all through there now. So uh, I would say homeschooling or even uh, religious schools where at least you have a hard core of Christian thinking to uh, protect the kids from the worst of the leftist mantra. I understand. Um, can you speak a little more about uh, feminism and how they uh, utilize that against us? Yes. Uh, feminism goes hand in glove with the whole thrust of egalitarian democracy. Uh, and, and I have a little thesis, which I wrote out in The Great Divide, about what's happened to the West. So I'm going to circle around and talk about feminism in a moment, if I could. Mm -hmm. When, uh, if I think North America, like, you know, the USA was settled, it was settled by Christian pilgrims, and so was Canada. Uh, people like that who came to the new world to get away from the oppressions of the old world. And they were interested in liberty. But when they used the word liberty, they never for once imagined it would be uh, like libertarian, that it would be freedom without moral context. Never. They wanted to be free so that they could practice their religions freely without oppression from governments or other church groups. So that was kind of the context of liberalism in the West when it began. But with the advent of John Locke and other thinkers like him, uh, this soon um, modified into a kind of economic liberalism, Pro the importance of private property, economic liberalism, and all that sort of thing. Um, and the Western democracies were all infected by, by this idea of individual liberty and property rights in particular. Uh, and that that kind of did a pretty good job for about 150 years. But what people began to notice during that 150 year period was that liberty wasn't enough. As I say, some people were rich, some people got poor, some people got smart, some people got stupid. And so the people who ran these Western democracies, again, with no conductor, there was nobody saying, look, look, Look at what look look at what I see. Everyone just kind of saw that there was an underclass being created in every Western democracy, worse in some Western democracies than others. 
arguably worst of all in some of the big American cities, which is where you had a lot of massive wealth, but also massive poverty, especially um, ethnic and class based poverty with uh, the black population of America, which had come out of slavery and so on. But even Canada was experiencing some of this and many European cities. So people started to say, what are we gonna do? Economic liberalism is, has been failing. We need, we need something uh, to correct it. So what they brought into, into play was um, egalitarian or equality liberalism. And this is the idea that we should change the foundation from liberty in our democracies to equality of outcomes. We should make people free and equal through policy, not just let them try on their own to be free and equal because they're failing. And it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to have a public philosophy with people sleeping in the streets and having tent cities and all that. And you can see them all over the place now, by the way, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, places like that. I don't know about Europe. I'm, I'm sure you have them too. Uh, so anyway, the third stage of liberalism was equality liberalism. Let's switch the foundation to equality and we'll just assume that liberty will take care of itself. If we can make everybody more equal through policy, funding, handouts, and all the rest of it. Uh, however, even that uh, created difficult created difficulties. And so, because it created a contradiction, how can you have a foundation in liberty and equality, excuse me, how can you have a foundation in liberty and forced equality at the same time? It doesn't make sense. They resist each other. They're gonna make each other crumble. So without a conductor again, what the leading intellectuals and thinkers started to say was equality and liberty, neither of these are enough. We need to split the body, um, the public body into two bodies, a private body and a public body. So we need libertarianism for individuals and we need public policy uh, for everything that the government can provide to the citizens equally. This is the last stage, in my view. I call it libertarian socialism uh, because the idea behind it is that you as an individual should have all the pleasures and liberties of the body that you could possibly want. Easy marriage, easy divorce, euthanasia for your aging parents, homosexuality if you want it or your kids want it, easy access to drugs, all the pleasures of the body are yours. You have a libertarian life privately, but when it comes to your role as a citizen in our democracy, we're gonna take a lot of your money and we're gonna force all sorts of public programs on all the citizens. Uh, in Canada, we say, amare usque ad mare, which means from sea unto sea, because we're bounded by oceans. So from coast to coast, we're gonna have egalitarian programs. I'll just give you an example of one in Canada. We call it public medicine or socialized medicine. Canada is the only country in the history of the world which has actually banned private medical care, made it illegal if the service is listed by the government. So if our government in any province of Canada agrees to give you a free medical service, whatever that may be, uh, nobody, no private doctor can offer that service privately and charge for it and be paid for it by a citizen. You are not free to ask a doctor to give you that service privately and you can't pay him and he can't accept it. So here we have what I call libertarian socialism. And if you were to ask me, what stage is this? I would say uh, peace to Fukuyama, by the way, who talked about the end of history. A catchy title, but history doesn't end unless his, unless the world ends. It keeps going. But I think this the end stage is not the liberalism that he liked a lot. It's libertarian socialism. I think it is a kind of end stage, end stage for the Western democracies because, you know why? Because people really like it. They like all the libertarian pleasures. Uh, it actually encourages them not even to think about what their government is doing to them. 
they just write tax checks at the end of the year or monthly or whatever they do, depending on the country, and they feel free as a bird. In Canada, we have so-called free medical care. People actually use that language proudly without ever saying to themselves, or their it, it's, it's not free, it's prepaid. The money has already been taken out of your pocket. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm just trying to say that libertarian socialism, I think, is the end of the game for the Western nations, democracies. How long can they keep going that way? I'd say as long as they can afford it, a very long time. The people who govern us love it, and the citizens love it because it makes them quiet and passive. I understand. Uh, but you wanted to connect that to feminism. You gave us that. Yes. Probably. Well, uh, these these uh, these uh, countries cannot survive without a hell of a lot in the way of taxes. It's better for them to get women out in the workforce working. And um, this connects to the whole feminist drive for so-called equality, which they cannot have um, under traditional societies because of their bi the biological necessities of childbirth and the nurturing of children. Um, so this comes down to a question of how do you get women out into the workforce if what you say about their biology is true? Well, you change the consequences of their biology by allowing them abortion on demand, for example, which enables them not to control birth, which is ridiculous, and it enables them to get rid of a birth so that it doesn't actually happen naturally. Um, all the Western democracies, I think except Poland now, are involved in this. And I consider this to be one of the most grievous realities uh, of our time. In fact, I would argue, and even some of my conservative friends <laughs> look at me when I say this, are you crazy? I said, no, just think about it. You know, I, I say that all the modern democracies um, have become slave regimes of a new kind. And my liberal friends frown and they say, what do you mean? Especially my one black liberal friend, a dear friend for 45 years now. And I say, look, you hate, you're a liberal, you hate slavery, right? He say, yeah. I, I say, well, the only thing that made black slavery possible was the definition of the black man as property. And that's exactly what we've done in Canada with the unborn child. We describe the unborn child in our criminal code as not a human being until it passes completely from the body of, the, of its mother, alive from the body of its mother. And then we say it's a human being. Until then, it's a non-human being. In other words, it's a piece of property that belongs to the mother. Well, it's shocking but true that even Pierre Trudeau, who was not a stupid man, he wasn't super smart either, but he certainly wasn't stupid, in an argument with a radical feminist who said, every woman has a right to abortion. He said, why? And she said, my body, my choice. He looked right at her and you know what he said? But we're not talking about your body. We're talking about someone else's body. And this just shut her down because she couldn't say it wasn't another human being inside her that she was carrying. She knew it wasn't an albatross or a snake or a turtle. It was a human being. And he put it right to her, right, right between the eyes, which stopped her in her tracks. But you see, all the Western democracies, as far as I know, except I think Poland, as I say, have accepted this idea that the child is a non-human being or a form of property until it's born, which means that children are slaves of their mothers. And we have become slave regimes of a new kind. It's easier for us because it's a little bit invisible compared to, say, a black slave or any other color slave walking around. Uh, but that's what it is. And I think philosophically and legally, you can't argue otherwise, because the only thing that makes someone a slave is depriving them of the category of human being and dealing with them legally as property. Uh, it's disgusting, this silent holocaust of uh, abortion. Uh, very it's upsetting. Quite phenomenal. Very, very, very yes. upsetting. It's going to get even easier for people soon because they're just doing the chemical abortion. Honestly, they'll just take the morning after pill and that'll do it. There'll be no more abortion clinics, no more any of that. 
They'll just buy a pill at the drugstore and take care of business. Disgusting. Um, yeah. Um, I would like to ask you about uh, the LGBT and uh, how they push it uh, and normalize it and also how they are using hypersexuality to, to, dis- to destroy the, the youth. And, and again, it's another uh, way to attack uh, the family. If you can talk a, bit, a little bit about that. Well, uh, I think this goes back to the roots of libertarianism in the Western world. In this case, it's about the idea that all sex is good sex, no matter with whom or when or how, and that any attempt to say otherwise is an oppression of your your liberty and your freedom. Now, in the larger picture, what this boils down to, and I encourage your listeners to To go to the Epoch Times, for which I've written quite a few essays in the past year, and look up an essay I wrote there. It's actually uh, edited and modified from a chapter in the book, The Great Divide, which I just held up. It's called The Triumph of Will Over Nature. That's what's going on in the West, is the idea that my will, in the form of my desires, my appetites, my loves, whatever, Uh, should triumph over my nature. So that's why we have people denying their sex at birth, talking about gender instead of biological sex, and that is if as if their sex slash gender is a matter of choice. It's whatever they think it is. And by the way, one of the things that drives me crazy is when responsi- supposedly responsible organizations like newspapers and television and other forms of media, Simply accept that idea from the person who's saying it. For example, someone says, well, I'm a, trans, I'm a trans, transgender man. My name is Lucy. You know, I have a woman's name now. I want you to call me Lucy. They refer to her as she in their story. And I say, why? Because if that person said, my name is Louis Napoleon, they wouldn't say, call him Louis Napoleon. They'd say, you're crazy. You're not Louis Napoleon. So why don't they say you're crazy, you're not Lucy? You can call yourself Peter Rabbit if you want, but you're obviously not a woman. You know, you've got male biological equipment, and it doesn't matter how you, how you mess with your body. It doesn't make you a woman in any, in any way, and vice versa. A woman can never become a man surgically or any other way. So why does the media... Um, Why are they fellow travelers with a strange capitulation to the bizarre notion that your nature is whatever you say it is? This is a revolt against nature itself, which is what my article, The Triumph of Will Over Nature, is all about. And it doesn't stop there. It extends to almost everything that is being done in the public square. And I think we should be fighting it, which I certainly do. So the, the next question is, how do we fight it? Is it too late? Did we already lose the war? And if we didn't, what can we take from conservatism uh, to help us? Like, how, how do we bring back the, the family values? How do we build back much better? <laughs> Not just. It's going it, it's to be tough, but I, if you're interested in some policy solutions to the breakdown of the family, I can suggest a few, which I think would make a big difference in... This, by the way, this may, there may be a turnaround down the road because the Western democracies are not having enough children. Uh, a man named Ben Wattenberg years ago wrote a book called The Birth Dearth, in which he described the coming failure of the Western democracies to replace themselves and hence their reliance on immigration to keep their populations afloat and therefore their economies. I mean, can you imagine? I think the um, I can't quote them now, but I think of twenty years ago, the um, uh, big university in the u s, the name of which will come to me in a moment, as a population center. Uh, they're really good at forecasting populations. And they actually forecasted that by the year two thousand and eighty or something like that, when what I call the great die-off is over, By the way, I'm part of the great die-off. I was born in 1940. I'm 81 now. 
when people like me are gone, there's going to be millions of us, baby boomers, post-war babies, all gone more or less at once, not being replaced. So the birth dearth um, book was all about that. And the fact that people are trying to handle the shrinkage of their populations and the democracies with immigration, I think, has proved to be terribly dislocating. For example, Canada's own government told us in the 1980s that we had six or maybe eight, they call them ethnic enclaves in Canada. You know, places where people of the same ethnicity tended to gather, build and buy their homes, set up their stores and all that kind of stuff. Chinese, Ukrainian, German, Chinese, whatever it was. But uh, when I wrote my book, uh, The Trouble with Canada Still, which was a revision and update of my original bestseller, I found out from our own government that we had 265 such ethnic enclaves. That was only 30 years later. So, and you know what's happening in various European cities like Paris, where they have no-go zone, where police won't even go. Um, so this is, this is part of the so-called solution to the birth dearth, but it's not sufficient. So here's just a few things I think any sensible government could do to help stimulate uh, birth in their own country. For example, allow the splitting of incomes before taxation. You know, some countries may do that now, but many of them moved away, moved away from it uh, because they wanted to drive women into the workforce. So a man who earned, say, $80,000 a year, he got taxed at an $80,000 rate. But I say if you allow split incomes before taxation, a woman who wanted to raise her own kids at home would be a, have a 40000 attributed to her and 40000 to him. They would both be taxed less than he was taxed individually. And the family would benefit accordingly, would have more money to spend on their children. You could also increase child dependency deductions. The province of Quebec, which has been very worried about the failure of childbirth in the province of Quebec, where it's been radical, has done lots of this kind of thing to try to stimulate birth. And it has worked to some extent, but it's not as much as they would like. And I say, well, maybe you should increase the amount. Maternity bonuses, you know, 7,000, 10,000 per child, going up for each child that you have. And I think something like mortgage deductibility uh, for, for any family that has a child under 18 living at home would be a fantastic incentive uh, for people to have and keep families. You could index all incomes for tax purposes, whereas now we have what they call bracket creep. People end up getting into higher tax brackets just because wages are going up when, in fact, the cost of living has gone up too, and they're no farther ahead, but they're getting taxed more. So, you know, same home care of elders uh, should also get these this kind of uh, tax treatment. Well, there's lots of other um, policies like this that, people a lot smarter than me could invent to promote family formation in the West, uh, because I think we're coming to a deadlock with mixed immigration because they're not integrating, they're not assimilating like they used to. And this is causing tremendous strain on Western democracies with respect to language, translation services, hospitals, even just picking up the telephone, asking somebody to get something done out there Half the time in Canada, you can't understand what they're saying, you know, and they're doing their best to speak your language, but it doesn't always cut it, and it makes life more difficult. Don't, don't you think that uh, one of the solutions will be to abolish the welfare st state, especially in regards to immigration? immigration? Absolutely. I have personal friends my age who came here with like 10 bucks in their pockets. A couple of them are millionaires now. I think... One of the problems with the welfare state is that you attract a different kind of fly to your fly paper, so yeah. to speak. You know, so people come here now who are looking for free dental care, free handouts and so on. My wife got involved in a community effort to help some immigrants who came here from uh, Syria recently. I couldn't believe it. They had eight children. 
the parents had no education to speak of. Eight children, God bless them, who, of course, are in, in the schools now. But this family was going to end up with something like $60,000 um, non-taxed income in their very first year here from who? You could say from our government, but of course it was from us. Uh, citizens are being taxed and immigrants are coming here for these kinds of benefits. I mean, I'm very moved by an immigrant who comes to a country like Canada and makes his own way and succeeds. It's very moving. And I'm not opposed to helping them a little bit, but I think we've gone way over the top. And it yeah. attracts a different kind of people. They're more dependency oriented people. They're not the kind of people who want to work for themselves and contribute. Not necessarily anyway. We know lots who do. And there's always, you're always going to have a certain number like that. It's very inspiring to see. A lot of them actually are supporting conservative values more than Canadian, the Canadian liberal population does. <laughs> so you almost start to say, we need more of those people because they believe in marriage, they believe in family, they believe in their children doing a hell of a lot of homework, you know, instead of goofing off and all that kind of laziness which seems to have permeated the rest of society. So to that extent, I think certain kinds of immigrants are, are good for us. They teach us what we used, used to know but have forgotten. Well, what is your opinion about the Western men nowadays and, and the fight for uh, values like we used to protect, like freedom? I know you make the distinction between freedom and liberty. It would be nice if you can say something about that too. But usually um, in, in the debates that we have, I usually hear the, the ladies, are, they are always asking, where are the men? Where are the men? What do you, what do you say about that? Well, I agree with them. I ask myself, where are the men? And I notice when I try to speak up like a man in public, you see these frowns and people looking at you in a funny way, funny way, because they don't expect it. Of course, I don't care. I, I do it anyway. Um, I think the male virtues of toughness and boldness and hard work and uh, aggressive defense of uh, family and uh, national values are to be applauded. And uh, uh, I don't like to see couples fighting over who does the vacuuming and who washes the floors and the diapers and all that kind of stuff. I got, I got the most wonderful wife in the world. And I remember one time in front of her mom and dad, she asked me, and I was changing tons of diapers at the time. We had five kids. And, uh, you know, you know, I'd take over at night when she was exhausted. And I had no problem with that kind of stuff. And I said, don't ask me to do that in public. I said, why? I said, well, just for the same reason, I don't ask you to take the garbage out in public. You know, it's unmanly and I don't like it. Doesn't mean I don't want to help doing chores around the house. I've done it all my life. And that includes diapers if need be. I have nothing against that, but I don't like the diminution of the male role in society or the female role. Now, it so happens that uh, gender roles have been incredibly important in traditional societies. And there's been a fight against that by feminists who are all about egalitarianism and wanting to be like men. It often makes me realize why so many Americans, for example, especially after the Vietnam War, wanted to marry Asian women because they knew they were getting into a pool of women who liked looking after their men, who wanted to look after their men, when wanted to be women looking after men who wanted to be men. Uh, so you're talking to somebody who's 81 now, but I'm not afraid to say, I'm embarrassed to see some of the men around me behaving like women, talking like women. And this even goes to easy tears. You know, I have a, I have a good friend who got into that. He's younger than me, but we ride bikes together and all that. But he's, he's into this easy crying because he feels this somehow makes him better as a man, more open, more emotionally accessible, and all the rest of it. And, and, yeah. and I don't like it. I said, listen, you know, these things become conventions in various societies. For example, in the 18th and 17th centuries, there was a convention that whenever a woman felt emotionally 
bombarded, she should faint. So women were expected to faint. Uh, just like now, you're expected to cry every time somebody mentions something that's emotional. I'm not saying don't get emotional. I do that myself, of course. But I do fight the tears in public a little bit. <laughs> Privately, that's, that's another matter. But in public, I don't like seeing a lot of men blubbering. Uh, especially when children see them. And I think the male role is incredibly important. And we've been letting our young men down. They're not being served properly in the schools. The male role model has been deteriorating in society, society at large. And this would manifest in all kinds of ways, which feed into the general thrust to leveling the genders, uh, which is part of the egalitarian thrust that we spoke of earlier. And that goes back to Plato again, you know, although he was no egalitarian, as I say, he was a totalitarian. He recognized the differences between men and women and soldiers and, um, you know, workers and so on. And, but he wanted each person within their own class treated the same way. I see. Um, do you still have the energy and the time to, to take a few questions, maybe from the audience? Uh, sure, let's do that. And then okay. I have some company coming. We, we got about 10 minutes, I think. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, one second. Any questions or comments, please? Well, we have... Uh, Silent audiences. Uh, I, I have the last question, if I may. Um, what is the source of objective and universal morals to you? Uh, because nowadays we are dealing with this uh, relativism, relativism. Sorry for my English. You, you understand me, I'm sure. And uh, so what if, if I had to debate someone and he would ask me, what is the source of goodness? How do we know what is moral? Is there a source of objective and universal a source to that? I'm glad you asked the question. And I, I, I can't reach it now. It's up on my shelf. But, and if you'll forgive the uh, flagrant self-promotion once again, I got very concerned about the persistence and uh, the growing persistence and presence of relativism in the Western democracies some years ago. I would go to a party, for example, like a cocktail party, and I would see someone and I would say, say to myself, I'm going to go over and strike up a little conversation. So I would go over and say something that I thought was indubitably true. And inevitably, this person would say, well, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. So this, this is my moment. So now I say, well, it can't be true and false at the same time. One of us must be wrong. And the gist of that is to ask him, let's talk about it and see which one of us it is. Instead, they go off and drink with someone else. And I realize this is a crisis. It's a crisis of our times. It's a crisis of the late 20th century. My father, who went to war to fight Nazi socialism, uh, had no problem with relativism. There was nothing relative in his life, believe me. Um, but it's everywhere now. And so I thought someone needs to do something about this. So I, I wrote a book called The Book of Absolutes. And I would love it if you could let your readers know. It's also available on my website. It, it got published by McGill University Press, um, which shouldn't scare anybody away, but it's a little more difficult academically than most of my other books. But it deals with the problem of relativism. The first chapter makes mincemeat of the whole concept of relativism right off the bat. And then it gets into physics and the problem with the notion of relativism in physics and um, the fact that even Einstein, for example, he wanted to call his theory not the theory of relativity, but the theory of invariance. Uh, which he regretted that he didn't do. And you'll see why when you read the chapter. But back to your question about moral values. Um, and I would say 
it's really interesting. There's a chapter called Human Universals in that book. Uh, and I draw heavily from a University of California professor named Donald Brown, whose book was called Human Universals. And he wrote it years ago because he was an anthropology student, PhD. And um, one of his friends pulled him over one day and he said, you know what? I want to ask you a question. He said, what's that? He said, I'm going to tell you something that I think is true of every society in human history and ask you what you think about it, because I know you're a relativist. So Brown said, yeah, what is it? So the guy mentioned what it was. I forget now what it was. But Brown went trotting off to the graduate library to try to find proof that what the fellow said wasn't true for every society. And he couldn't. He couldn't find any anthropological evidence in any of the literature that every society in the world didn't do what he said he was certain they were doing. So he went back and said, okay, I lost my 20 bucks. How about another bet? And the guy did it again. And this went on quite a few times. And Brown began to realize that there must be hundreds of human universals that nobody was talking about because they're all talking about cultural relativism and that sort of thing, which was in the air at the time in the 80s. So Brown eventually devoted his life to the study of human universals. And he helped to generate a file at Yale University where they now keep a massive inventory of universals, cultural, moral, biological, whatever. Every kind of universal you can think of is kept from an anthropological point of view in a file at Yale University. And anyone can go into that file and dig up the information. But if you want the short version, you can get it in my book of absolutes in the chapter called Human Universals. It's in there. You know, and then there's a chapter on the natural law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, other than God, and for people who believe in God or who have a religion which is God-based, um, the idea of natural law and human universals, moral and otherwise, is no surprise. Uh, but the book will lay out, even for atheists who don't believe in God, they will at least be able to see that these human universals are true, vindicated, supported, and proven uh, for every society on earth. And that's a glass of cold water thrown in the face of the cultural and moral relativ relativist like the fellow I met at the party. I didn't have the book then, but now if I met him, I could say, Go get a copy of my book, and uh, you'll see the proof. Thank you very much. Uh, I put a link to your book in the main channel, and uh, of course, I will continue to promote it later. Um, if if you can just uh, do us a small favor, and uh, it doesn't have to be today, but maybe you can generate a small list of very important conservative <laughs> philosophy uh, uh, books that can help us uh, understand and equip ourselves with better. <laughs> And knowledge um, for, for the future. If, if that's I'd be happy to do that. Maybe a, maybe a dozen of the ones that I have found most helpful. Please do. Yes. And I'll, and I'll send it to you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just ask again if there are any questions before we finish. Guys, questions or comments, please. Please raise your hand. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, would you be willing to come again for another talk, please? If you're not tired of me, I'd be happy to do it anytime. This is what I've been doing for 30 years, and um, I enjoy it as long as you do. Of course we do, and I will be very happy to welcome you again as soon as you can. Uh, your kind of knowledge is uh, life-saving. Um, so, so, yeah, I would love that. Uh, I think we have... You're too kind, but thank you for having me. Uh, we have two questions. Let's uh, let's try. Uh, go ahead, please, Shaza. Good evening from Northern Ireland. I would just like to say thank you so much for all of this information. You are a fountain of knowledge, and I look forward to reading your book. Love and prayers from Northern Ireland. Thank oh, thank you very much. Uh, D, go ahead, please. Oh, hello. Good evening, William. 
I actually just uh, checked you on a Google and it seems that you are really very interesting uh, gentleman. Um, you, I, I'm reading here that you're an athlete, an academic, a businessman and successful author. So what do you actually see yourself mostly being then? Academic, businessman or successful <laughs> author? What is actually dearest to your heart? I, I really would like to hear that. Well, it's interesting you ask me that because just this morning I finished put the finishing touches on a memoir of my of my life. Uh, and if you know of any good publishers who might publish it, I'd like to hear from you. In that, in that, I describe how in the very early stage of my life I was a very sick young boy. I spent a lot of time in bed. My only memory up until about eight years of age was mostly in and out of bed and hospital. Uh, but then somehow when I went to school, I realized that uh, there were bullies in every school, but they had to catch me first and I could outrun a lot of them. And that's how I learned to love, to love running. And um, I was a, became a big frog in a small pond as an athlete at that school, did very well in track and field in particular. And to me, I realize now psychologically that this this was kind of my salvation. I could I could beat sickness with physical exercise and making myself stronger. And I think what happened later in my life, because even to, you know I'm 81 now, and even today, I had a good 25 kilometer bike ride over about about uh, 700 meters of climb in the hills today before this show. So it's still with me uh, somehow psychologically. I've had this feeling that if I can stay fit and strong athletically, that I can beat sickness away because it was a terrible memory. But I think what happened over time, you know, I did some business and I got into writing books, excuse me, and so on, because I thought fixing my body is one thing, but fixing the political body of my country is another so it, I, I, I somehow ended up devoting myself to, through books and essays, to trying to fix uh, the trouble with Canada first, and then uh, general troubles in the Western democracies with some of the other books. So that was kind of the story. I just do thank you for your lovely answer. And you're such a lovely, inspirational uh, gentleman. I really love listening to you, especially as we are all dealing and surviving in this uh, um, current time. Um, I'm just actually looking at you. You are in uh, three other groups in Telegram. Are you actively taking part as well? Or are you just reading through other Telegram groups? Sorry to be this personal, but I really love to hear about what you do, really. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to share it. I haven't been participating much in anything on the web. And I haven't even been posting articles on my own website lately because I've been trying to finish this memoir. And today I finished it. So I'm going to be more free to, to get involved. Thank you for the invite. Thank you, Dee. Um, that, that's just, uh, I just have one more question uh, i'm sorry i'm really so impressed with you <laughs> uh, just want to ask you what would be your um advice i mean as you have experience and you're really doing it beautiful way of exercising and really taking a responsibility for your own health um to stand up against as you said um bullies which you dealt as a child what do you um from your experience, what can you actually suggest? What's the best way forward? It, it's not just the Canada that is uh, dealing with the current issue, but it seems whole Western world and rest of the world, of course. But one sentence, what can we do to help to win, for positive to win? Well, I mentioned earlier, you should do what my father told me to do. He said, know what you think, <clears throat> say what you think and do what you say. I, found, I find that we live in a cowed society now. Even my own children, who are wonderful, bright, well-spoken adults now, they say, but dad, you know, you, you say that. You say that in public and they're gonna jump all over you. And I say, well, so what? They jump all over you. Tell them that you, you can't debate their emotions, but you can debate their ideas. Please, 
let's hear your ideas. And then I'll tell you my ideas. So then you'll be involved in an adult discussion instead of a juvenile shoot, shouting match, which everybody goes to first. And that's too bad. So I think one of the things we have to do is retrain our whole society to think and speak in defense of their own convictions. And of course, that implies, as I said earlier, first of all, having convictions. If you don't have any convictions, you're not going to be a very good debater. When I was a young man sitting around a dinner table, I mean, nobody, those people weren't perfect, of course, but if an older person asked you a question, you could you could get away with saying, I'm not sure. And he would say, oh, sure, you're young, fine. But if you actually did give an answer to the question or an opinion, you were expected to defend it. And if you defended it simply emotionally or with stupid arguments, you were going to hear about it. And older people felt that was part of their duty to bring up the young with good debate. You know, and even my grandfather who was a very strong, very successful man who became a multimillionaire and then lost it and then became a multimillionaire again. He was like that kind of person, like a rough and tumble go-getter. He, You know what he said to me once when I was young? He said, listen, he said, Billy, he said, even if you're going to be wrong, for God's sake, speak up. <laughs> so That's just think, so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. I, I must tell you that you have been an inspiration for me since I heard you the first time on the free, free domain radio with Stefan Molyneux. I think it yes. was maybe even 10 years ago. I'm not sure. 10 years, 10 years. Yeah, uh, that was brilliant. And since then, I was like trying to follow your work. And uh, I must tell you, the people on the Telegram, uh, many of the groups here, they have um, an appetite and uh, a need for knowledge and guidance because we feel like we are dealing with a, a corrupting uh, and, and decaying civilization. And, and we, need, yeah. uh, we need some light and some better understanding. So uh, I would really like for you to come again whenever you feel comfortable. The, the, the platform is open for you. And uh, I, I like it a lot. Uh, <clears throat> I had to leave the world of teaching for reasons I can uh, share sometime. I was in the university at York University as a professor of English literature. And uh, I left the university. Uh, to take on a family business, which was struggling very badly. And um, anyway, I can share all that history with you sometime. But uh, all this political correctness, shutting down of thought was beginning then. Uh, I'll give you an example. I went to the chairman because the university had a terrible drop in enrollments. And they started talking about letting faculty go. And I went to the chairman and I said, on what basis will you let the faculty go? And he, and he said, and I said, because it's going to, going to be based on merit. I'm willing to stand with anybody. I love teaching and I'll stand on my merits. And he said, well, you know, it's not going to be that. He said, we consider you all equally meritorious. And I said, well, you know, that's a lot of crap. He said, it's just not true. And no, he said, we won't use merit. It'll be on first, uh, last to come, first to go. Well, I was the last professor they hired in the last year they hired anybody. So when my dad said the family business is in trouble, we like your help. You have a PhD from Stanford University. You're an Olympic athlete. And this happened to be a fitness and health business, a large one, which was terribly struggling. He said, would you come over and help us? And so I did. And the reason I did was I thought I could maybe turn it around in, say, five years, make it successful and sell it and make enough money that I could put it away and write books, uh, which is what I've done ever since. I sold the company in 1988. The Trouble with Canada was in draft and uh, it came out and I got lucky. It became a national bestseller and I became a lightning rod for the left ever since. I hear you. So thank you again, William. God bless you. Please stay good thank care you. of yourself. 
Thank you very much. You too. Okay. Bye, now. Uh, bye for now. I'm going to open the floor for a free conversation and I'm okay. going to end the recording.